Welcome, my friends! Today we will be discussing experimental designs. There's quite a bit of important terminology and concepts in this video, and for that reason, I recommend that you take notes and watch the video on a few separate occasions to make sure you are retaining the key ideas. Pause the video along the way to make sure you understand each concept or definition before moving on. We will begin by distinguishing between two common methods of data collection in statistics, which are the observational study and the experiment. In an observational study, the researcher observes or questions the individuals without imposing any conditions on them. Observations are taken without any active intervention to manipulate the outcome of the study. We might conduct a survey, asking individuals how often they smoke cigarettes, and then measure things like the rates of cancer or other health issues. There is no intervention on the part of the researchers to set up a situation where certain individuals were told to smoke or not to smoke, which is what makes this an observational study. In an experiment, the researcher imposes varying conditions on individuals in various groups in order to observe a response. An example could involve treating individuals with a new experimental medication to help treat insomnia or lack of sleep. Typically, experiments have at least two groups of participants that will receive differential treatment. For example, we might have patients in the insomnia study either receive the new experimental medication, receive the old standard medication, or receive a sugar pill with no active ingredients, oftentimes called a placebo. After some period of time, each individual would somehow be measured to determine how much their condition has improved. In a study like this, we may have to resort to simply asking the patients how much their sleep has improved, but ideally we would be able to measure the improvement in some objective way to determine if the treatment, in this case the experimental medication, really is effective. In both observational studies and experiments, and in a variety of other contexts within statistics, there will be what are called explanatory and response variables. The explanatory variable, also known as the independent variable, is the variable the researcher wants to investigate to determine its impact on the response variable, oftentimes called the dependent variable. An example might include the age and weight of a child in pounds. The explanatory variable is age, and the response variable is weight. As a child grows older, as the explanatory variable increases, the child gains weight. The response variable increases. The relationship is obvious here. As a child gets older, they will tend to gain weight, but in other circumstances it might be less clear. An experiment can show a causal relationship between the explanatory and response variables, but an observational study typically cannot. By causal, I mean that a change in the explanatory variable alone, everything else equal, will cause a change in the response variable. The reason why observational studies can't prove causation is due to what are called lurking variables, additional variables generally not collected in a study that actually do affect the response variable. Check out my video on correlation, linked in the description, if you want to learn more about lurking variables. In a properly designed experiment, members of all treatments will be randomly assigned to each group, and ideally have exactly the same characteristics, such as height, weight, gender, etc. Effectively, an experiment controls for lurking variables, holds them equal, since each group has about the same values for any of these variables, leaving the only possible reason for a change in the response being the explanatory variable. Thinking back to our insomnia medication example, the explanatory variable is form of medication as either new medication, old medication, or placebo. The response variable might be how many hours the individual sleeps in the night. Notice here the explanatory variable is categorical, represented by the three different treatment groups in our experiment. As long as we have randomly assigned members of our study to each of the three treatment groups, the only reason we should expect to see a change in response, hours of sleep at night, is due to which treatment group the individual is assigned to. Here is a visual representation of the insomnia study variables. The explanatory variable is the type of medication as either new, old, or placebo, and the response variable, which we believe to be influenced by the explanatory variable, is the number of hours of sleep the individual gets in a night. There is some more terminology related to experiments we should discuss before moving forward. The individuals for which the response variable is measured in an experiment are classified as the observational units. 
In our insomnia study, each individual person is an observational unit. But in other cases, an observational unit could be a plant, or a tree, or an animal, or something else. Whatever individual person or object we are gathering the data from is our observational unit. Sometimes there might be multiple explanatory variables. In our insomnia example, we had the explanatory variable of form of medication, with the three levels of new medication, old medication, or placebo. A second explanatory variable might be sex, with two levels, either male or female. If an explanatory variable is specifically imposed or controlled for by the researcher, we call that variable a factor. The explanatory variable of medication is considered a factor as it is imposed by the researcher. The individuals were randomly assigned to these groups. The explanatory variable of sex is not a factor as it is not imposed by the researcher. People, of course, come into the study already as either male or female, and the researchers most likely aren't going to change that over the course of the experiment. The treatments include all possible combinations of all factor variables. Remember that a factor is something specifically imposed or controlled for by the researcher. If there are multiple factors, that can create numerous treatment combinations. Suppose in an experiment, the two factors are medication type and caffeine usage. We would classify both variables as factors only if they are imposed by the researcher. This means the researcher would need to instruct individuals to either consume or not consume caffeine in the study in order for caffeine usage to be a factor. If participants can self-select whether or not they consume caffeine, then we have lost the randomization aspect and can no longer consider caffeine usage a factor. In this example, there would be 3 times 2 equals 6 treatments that individuals in the study would be randomly assigned to. There are 3 levels of medication and 2 levels of caffeine usage, which is why the calculation is 3 times 2. The 6 possible treatments are the new medication with caffeine, the new medication without caffeine, old medication with caffeine, old medication without caffeine, placebo with caffeine, and placebo without caffeine. The response variable would be observed for all six groups to determine which one has the best results. We have already mentioned the convention of having one of the levels of the explanatory variable represent a placebo group. Whenever possible, it is convention to have a placebo group in a designed experiment. Think back to our insomnia example. Many individuals from group 3 will credit the placebo with curing their insomnia, even though there is no active medication in their pill. Many attribute this to the power of the mind, or willpower, that individuals who believe they are receiving medication, but really aren't, tend to improve. For this reason, new medications usually have to outperform a placebo to be considered effective. The control group is the group that does not receive any treatment, and oftentimes receives a placebo instead. In our case, group 3 is the control group, but sometimes the control group might not receive a placebo for various reasons. For example, if your experiment relates to plant growth and fertilizer, it wouldn't make much sense to give some of the plants a fake fertilizer. Instead, a standard fertilizer, or perhaps no fertilizer at all, might be considered the control group, which would be compared to a new competing fertilizer. A double-blind experiment is one in which the researchers and participants are unaware who is part of the treatment group and who is part of the control group. So if there are six treatment combinations, as we saw earlier, Neither the subjects in the sleep study, nor the researchers working with the subjects, know who is in each of the six treatment groups. For practical reasons, this isn't always possible, but it is ideal in order to reduce bias. A completely randomized experiment is what we have been alluding to this entire time, and is the case where individuals are randomly assigned to the treatments of each factor variable. Ideally, if there are six treatment combinations as there were in our example, each member has a 1 in 6 chance of being assigned to any of the six treatment combinations. Okay, let's look at a few examples. The owner of a Christmas tree farm wants to determine which of three fertilizers, A, B, or C, is the most effective at stimulating growth. Each tree is randomly assigned to a fertilizer. After seven years, the height of each tree is measured. Take a minute to pause the video and see if you can correctly identify the response variable, the observational unit, the factor variable, and the treatments. Okay, the response variable is the height of the tree. This is what we are measuring after the 7 year period has elapsed. 
The observational unit is the person or individual that data is collected from. In our case, an observational unit is just an individual tree, as the tree is what we are measuring the height from. The factor variable, which is our explanatory variable, is the type of fertilizer. Since there is only one factor variable, the treatments are simply the three levels of the factor variable, either fertilizer A, B, or C. Let's look at one more example. Assume the same situation, but now in addition to fertilizer A, B, and C, the farmer would also like to experiment with using no fertilizer at all. Also, there are four different types of trees being grown. Fraser firs, Colorado Bruce spruces, Douglas firs, and Scottish pines. Take a moment to pause the video and see if you can identify the following. Okay, the two factor variables are type of fertilizer and type of tree. Each of these are being imposed by the researcher. The researcher determines both which fertilizer to use and which type of tree to plant. For levels, there are four fertilizer levels, which are A, B, C, and none, and there are four different types of trees. This means that there are a total of four times four equals 16 different treatment combinations. The control group includes all trees grown without fertilizer. This is not considered a placebo. Placebos typically only make sense with human subjects. If you are curious, you can see here are the 16 different treatment combinations. There are many different possible results from this experiment. It could be the case that a single fertilizer outperforms the others for all four trees, such as fertilizer A. Or it could be the case that a certain fertilizer, perhaps fertilizer A, is better for one tree, and perhaps another fertilizer, maybe fertilizer B or C, is better for the other trees. It also could be the case that fertilizer does not have any effect at all. Alright my friends, we have finished our discussion of experimental designs. We will be exploring many more fun and exciting statistical topics that you won't want to miss, so make sure to subscribe and check out our other videos.